Play that epic music because 20 years ago, the world was watching one fantasy film trilogy to rule them all. And its final installment, The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, arrived in American theaters on December 17th, 2003. From the beacon's lighting of Minas Tirith to Frodo's and Sam's desperate fights against Shelob to the ear-tingling charge of the Rohirrim onto the fields of Pelennor, how did we first experience this grand finale to the Lord of the Rings film series? Welcome back to Fantastical Truth, the podcast from lorehaven.com season finale today. On this podcast, we explore fantastical stories for God's glory. I'm E. Steve Burnett, the publisher of Lorehaven, a Lord of the Rings fan for just over 22 years. I got to it late, and I'm the co-author of The Pop Culture Parent. And I'm Zachary Russell, and a day may come when the voices of men fail, when we forsake our microphones and break all bonds of podcasting. But it is not this day, because it's episode 192, 20 years ago. How did Return of the King rule the movies? And we're joined right now with Rillian from Narnia Web. What's up, Rillian? Hey, guys. He just appeared in the middle of nowhere, and he stuck something back in his pocket. What have you got in your pocket, Rillian? <laughs> it uh, just might be my set of green and gold rings. Oh, green correct. and gold. Wait a minute. We just have some uh, mixed up lore there. Green and gold rings are from Uncle Andrew's <laughs> Dark Magic in The Magician's Nephew, book six of the Chronicles of Narnia. <laughs> and you're using the ring for uh, the other purpose from the other universe. Anyway, uh, Rillian's been here before. Magic ring or no, we call him Rillian of Narnia Web because uh, that is his code name as a fan. It, literally, he's the only Rillian. No digits, uh, no underscores, nothing. That's his username on the forum. He is a Tolkien geek who keeps a watch on Narnia as well and a longtime member of the NarniaWeb.com fan community. Rillian started his original podcast back in the mid-2000s. Now he's the co-host of Talking Beasts, the Narnia podcast, along with friends Glum Puddle and Jim Fan. And together they explore Narnia books and films, interviewing Lewis scholars and film actors. And this, by the way, is the fourth episode of uh, Rillian's Fantastical Truth trilogy. I promised last year for the Christmas special that I might go, uh, you know, Hollywood and extend that trilogy into four movies. And so I have. We try to keep our promises here. So really, and welcome back. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, and I know we're talking about Lord of the Rings, but quick, what's a, uh, what's a Narnia in the movies or on the, the small screen update? Yeah, so the biggest updates, uh, there's actually a couple of updates. Um, one, the, the one that I'm not so keen on is Greta Gerwig is, uh, is pretty much confirmed she is going to be directing to probably writing and directing two narnia films we've just been debating which ones they are if it's magician's nephew wardrobe wardrobe magician's nephew if it's going to be the silver chair i, I uh we don't know that's not been confirmed uh right now the debate is on gerwig herself and how good or bad she will be for the series I myself am pretty uh skeptical uh i have a pretty cynical take and that's not just gerwig that's really more hollywood writ large just the state of where like i don't think that peter jackson could make the lord of the rings as faithfully to the books today if he were still the same director uh, i don't i don't think it would happen the other update that's been kind of interesting is just some of the interesting things happening with theater and logos theater which is based in south carolina they did a line that went to the wardrobe that went well and then they did they really upped their but that was more my understanding i did not see it, it was kind of a community theater type you know project and then they did Prince Caspian, which got a lot more attention because of their use of puppets, and then Horse and His Boy. And now Prince Caspian and the Horse and His Boy are touring the U.S. in Branson, Missouri, and in Washington, D.C. So Prince Caspian, is, I think, is going to be there soon. Horse and His Boy is going to be in Kentucky at the Ark Encounter starting next month. And I've seen the Horse and His Boy twice now. They made some improvements since the last time. There's definitely some polish that they can still add to it, but it's really kind of minor things. I mean, I think it's, I think they're probably going to, they do, they do little script rewrites, you know, here and there. I think they, they can definitely improve it in terms of pacing, but technically it's gotten even better since the premiere. And it's really special to see all the care and love. But uh, if anyone's got an interest in seeing Narn good Narnia theater, I would look at Logos Theater's website and go check them out. I, I have a friend in DC. I said, hey, you got to go see Prince Caspian when it's there. So. That's been really cool to see some of the developments there. And they're currently working on the silver chair. 
So the horses are these giant puppets that we've seen, uh, not like one guy who's the front of the horse and the other guy is the back of the horse, you know, with the kind yeah, of, yeah, it's actually three middle. people per horse. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's the puppeteers on stage beside the, horses the horse. Are three guys in a trench coat. So yeah. Yes. So, yeah. So the, uh, <laughs> in fact, I showed a friend of mine, the, the video granted was smaller. It was on my phone, right? I showed a coworker the video. I said, this is a, from the play of the horse and his boy. He goes, oh, okay. Yeah. They're the horses. I said, they're not real. He goes, they're not real. Just because like it, once he kind of looked closer, he could tell, but based on the movement, he couldn't tell. It's, it crosses it, it, that uncanny it crosses valley. crosses that line. It's wow. very, the puppetry is very, very well done. It's really stunning to, I mean, you're, you're in, fully invested in the, the Bree and Wynn as characters, the names of the two horses. They do a great job with it. It's really cool to see it. And right now they said the challenge for the silver chair is all the giants. They think oh, they figured out. So they think they figured out how to do it, but they want to do all of the giants, uh, and that's that's a big technical challenge. They've done. They do a really good job, and they figured out a good way to do the dwarves too. They have regular actors playing the dwarves, but it doesn't look cheap or weird. But they've got the way the costumes are done. Even it was very creative. Where like they they look like dwarves walking around, but they're not. They don't, they're, they're not played by kids or pretending that they're. Oh, well, we're just pretend they're short. You know, they're not doing that either. So they do some really cool stuff. That's great. I mean, as a theater dad, my, my oldest two are in musical theater in a show right now as we record this. I love all this and I used to not like theater at all, but I think especially post COVID, there's something so much more magical about it when everything is CGI and movies now. And, you know, we've been stuck. We were locked behind our screens forever. Yeah. And it's like, it's just so much more fun to see something live. And I where, love it. Where it is more yeah. low tech than, you know, what, what they could do in a movie, but it, it's so much more fun. And it is a blend. It is a, it is say, if you're familiar with like the sight and sound theaters in Philadelphia and Branson, which do biblical tales, those are very high production, but everything like if there's like a city, they just do the whole city. It's either a matte painting in the background or they've got like 10 buildings on set, right? These amazing structures. This is a lot more abstract in style, but I don't when I say abstract, I don't mean more. It's not cheaper. I mean, they, they have very good set pieces when they have them. They have very good costumes and stuff. But a lot of it is, it does use your imagination, which only theater can do. And I, I love yeah. that. Here's a quick example. I asked the, some of the puppeteers about this backstage. So like a couple of the puppets, one was like the, a lion, like it's like a savage looking lion, right? That chases a bunch of the characters in the story. And the lion, like the eyeballs of the lion, like they have pupils and irises and like, and I said, why did you not add pupils and irises for the horses? Because it's just black glass orbs in the sockets, right? So why did you not add pupils and irises for the horses, which are talking characters, right? Those horses talk. And it's their characters in the story. And he said, what we found is if we did that, it was like a little more realistic, but not realistic enough. And it just added this vacant stare into the creature's eyes. So that's fine for, a, for an animal, but you can't have that for a character that talks. It needs, they said, so if we, took out the pupils it was just a black glass it, it you just kind of your imagination just kind of filled in that it was looking around and looking at other people they said the same with the horse's mouth they said we had the horse's mouths moving and talking initially synced up with the audio we got rid of it because it was not quite mm. realistic enough and they said if we just got rid of it you didn't even think about it wow your imagination just like took over now that's some and, fascinating uh, on the spot uh, social science going on there uh -huh. I, I just love the fact that it is people who are either sympathetic to christianity or Christians who are actually doing better making stories for the stage and sometimes even the screen. And then, of course, also for the printing press, which leads me to our top sponsor for this episode, Season Ender. Uh, this is our top sponsor, Oasis Family Media, and they're sponsoring this episode in part on behalf of its family of companies, including Sky Turtle Press, Oasis Audio, and Enclave Publishing. They wanted me to let you know that their teams want to wish you and your family and friends a very merry and very blessed Christmas and a new year full of happiness, prosperity, and peace. They say, we are truly grateful for all of our readers and listeners. Enclave is rolling out even more books, Christian-made fantastical titles, and you can get all of those by going to enclavepublishing.com. And you can also find that link in our show notes for episode 192 or go to lorehaven.com slash podcast sponsors. All right, uh, Rillian, let's get to our concession stand real quick. It's almost Christmas as we're recording. 
Uh, I, man, I mean, we should be talking more about Narnia as well. Um, I'm a little bit more optimistic about Netflix just because they did so well with One Piece, but that doesn't mean that a completely other director and creative team would uh, benefit from the same adaptation philosophy. Uh, but we are here to talk about Return of the King, by all accounts, a terrific adaptation. And so although uh, we might uh, critique some elements of the movie, the avalanche of skulls, for example, a dopey bit of dialogue here or there, and the fact that uh, when Samwise climbs up the rest of Orodrin uh, to enter uh, the uh, path leading to Mount Doom, his feet kind of slide on the stone. And we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about that. It's a perfect movie, right? It's perfect. <laughs> uh, I will say, though, I'm guessing I, I for my part, like I'm not going to critique stuff that other people critique, like the multiple endings of The Return of the King. Guys, right. it is like a classic film fantasy trilogy that redefined cinema for the ages. It is allowed to have multiple endings. It's allowed to take its time. In fact, I say it didn't have enough endings. I still think that's a silly criticism. <laughs> this one, I think, offers all of us uh, a chance before Christmas uh, just to celebrate an epic, informative story. Uh, and although Rillian and I last time uh, got after the, uh, the Hobbit uh, trilogy, uh, there's definitely a lot of flaws in that one. Uh, the Lord of the Rings ain't like that. Uh, any other concessions that you all have? Uh, Zach, any uh, concession? to offer well it, it's been decades since i've read the book so i i just really know the movies and you know i okay i'm, I'm just gonna th this is more of a confession booth thing than a concession <laughs> stand okay, you can still take snacks in there too it's totally allowed here i i just learned or relearned about the actual ending of the trilogy where they go back to the shire and have to defeat uh, is it sharky no, um, this, well it's uh Hey, if you don't remember if you want who to Sharky the spoilers, is, yeah, yeah let's I, I just spoiler, that spoiler. Yeah. Sharky, just, that's a total, can, con, total they, confession there. Okay, yeah, there's a scouring that was left out. That would have been one too many endings for the movies, anyway. Right, and it was. Uh, I, I read a really interesting article about uh, th this whole, you know, having to retake the Shire after they've like conquered Sauron, and, and it was just a very different challenge for them. Uh, and it was more social than it was physical, in, in a sense. But uh, anyway, th there's a lot of analogies you can make from that the hobbits get into a culture war yeah exactly <laughs> yeah well they, 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 they fro everything was fine until frodo and sam and mary and pippin came back they just started the culture war i don't know why they're picking these fights <laughs> that's true that's true they're the initiators they should have gone there and then uh, preached the gospel if necessary used words i would have liked to have seen that ending is, is what i'm trying to say I, I think that could have made a more interesting ending i you know, people talk about the multiple endings. I think it's more that they're repetitive or they feel repetitive. It would have been very, very difficult to do. But so I did. Zach, are you an audio book guy at all? Yeah. Okay. Andy Serkis has done all of the Lord of the Rings. Yes. Mm. It's and, and they're, they're and excellent. the Silmarillion. And I, I will just say, it's not just oh, obviously his golem is going to be, be amazing, right? His Aragorn is amazing. His Gandalf is amazing. His Samwise is amazing. He is good at every single character. Wow. So I, I heartily recommend it if you want to like re-experience the books in some way. I just finished uh, all of those, I think, either this spring. I think I finished The Return of the King. Um, I went through all of them, and I'm doing the Silmarillion right now. But he is... Uh, but yeah, I think, having re-experienced that, I think that that was something, like, every time now when I rewatch the movie, one of my things I can't get, it's kind of a bad taste in my mouth, there is something lost, them coming back, and the Shire being completely untouched. There is some depth to the story that That's Tolkien true. brought. I, I think they could have done something. I don't know. They, they shouldn't have done like the whole Sharky story, but I think they could have done something where they come back and they have to rebuild. I think that because I think it cheapens some of the experiences they went through if they come back and everything's pristine. Because what they went through was so transformative. Everything was transformed. The whole world was transformed. Right. Nothing was untouched um, like they wanted it to be. Right. And that that is something that I can't it's a little hump i have to get over every time i watch the movie yeah it was certainly a transformational piece of cinema cinema i think the still the only films to get 11 oscars are titanic and ben-hur yeah the just those three I don't, I, think. I don't think any i don't think avatar came i think he got like nine no it was uh it was absolutely transformational and a, a rare example of the critics and mass audiences getting together to agree that this movie this yes. trilogy was fantastic i was watching there was a twi uh, a journalist from the new york times i saw very recently on twitter well i say recently on twitter it was still twitter at the time so not super super recently but it's fairly recently, recent twitter. history and she said 
just finished the movie The Return of the King and realized that this is when cinema peaked. Correct. No, this is the correct. Like, that, that was basically the decade. I think that was the decade we got Les Miserables. That was the decade oh, we got Return yeah. of the King. You know, where like the critics and the masses all realized, oh my goodness, this is like Les Miserables, are, like probably the last example where like they were like a piece of culture, high culture like that, yeah. that everyone came together and celebrated. Mm, also, a Christian author, I think I see a pattern here. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that, is, uh, that is very true. So, all right, so we, we've skipped ahead to uh, the response to Return of the King, but now <laughs> cast your imaginations back more than 20 years ago, all three of us, for chapter one of our discussion in 2003. Uh, that was after The Two Towers released in 2002. Now we know, we already know, we've got the next movie on the way just one year later. In 2003, how did we anticipate The Return of the King? Two films down, one to go. Zach, where were you in anticipation of this uh, trilogy? Well, that's the interesting thing. I was living in a foreign country in the continent of Asia, which I shall not uh, name specifically. Shall not utter here. (laughs) Teaching English, quote unquote. Right, yeah, exactly. (laughs) So I had to find a uh, bootleg version of the DVD, yeah. Um, Although I think we might have seen this one in theater, come to think of it, but uh, typically we would find, you know, bootleg dvds were <gasps> uh yeah that was about all they that was 90 percent of the dvds at the that's time. why i <laughs> title the two towers i once saw on the internet where it's a gimli running there aragorn legolas and gimli are chasing after uh the band of urukai and gimli's speech is uh, subtitled keep praising that's the key <laughs> they just made yeah. it more christian <laughs> Yeah, thankfully this that was a clean copy that we saw. It wasn't uh you know just a guy holding a movie camera a video camera in the movie theater, which oh, uh, always always made those kinds of interesting. But yeah, that it was really fun though to see that with a group of fellow American Christians seeing something very meaningful to us uh, at a time when we're feeling very disconnected from our own families, our own culture because it's around the Christmas season and we're in a country that doesn't really celebrate Christmas or it has sort of Christmas decorations, but not really understanding the reason for them. So that it was a very special thing to see it in that way. So really, and I think you and I were of the type who were uh, excruciatingly downloading the trailers over the QuickTime app uh, over uh, low speed internet back then. It wasn't uh, how did six key modem, but it was I like know. pretty. <laughs> you you wake up in the morning and you just uh, hope to Jesus that the whole thing didn't get interrupted in between. Yes, and then you, exactly. You well, I would like I would download like the like whatever like the little tiny tiny resolution one, you know, like the two hundred fifty six, you know, that one across was slightly yeah. faster. But yeah. is it worth it? it download a little the faster. I watch it. And I, 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 I put my eyes close to the screen. Oh, that looks that looks. It was the audio was still there, and then you watch that, and then you like re-download it on uh something you know just like, like 640 if you were lucky enough to go to whatever. community college at the time which i was uh then you could use the uh the high speed internet that they had uh, installed to get ahead of the future so i, I was 16 we did have like dual isdn at the time so it was a little faster i was 16 and yeah i was like watching the trailers i was on i think the most active form i was on was a ringbearer.org which i don't think is even around anymore i've not even um, heard of that one just yeah the one they, they were Net very active org. forums forums on ringbearer.org uh, i was also on the one ring.net but i think they kind of intentionally kept their forums kind of like a, a weird like a reddit style forum uh which i didn't like but so i was on a bunch of different forums and just like in fantasyvault.com had a very active lord of the rings community and I, I, it was like all these like fun discussions you know about the lord of the rings and uh picking it apart and tearing it apart but it was also different because it wasn't like the like what happens today where like you know nerd erotic is tearing apart the you know the movies and rightfully so but like and this is from a place of like maybe justified hatred (laughs) But some these were like we loved them, but we still took to, tore them apart. You know, we it was, we weren't shilling for it. There was none of that back then. Like no one was like shilling for these movies. Oh, yeah. But people well, it's like more like oh, how goodness, friends would tease each these. other and roast each other yeah, like, out like, of we mutual love love affection. We're so glad they're doing such a great job, and they're still they're not perfect. And we're going to destroy all the little details that they got wrong, right? And uh, you know, and I was a little more optimistic with some of my friends after two towers. Oh my goodness, what they did with Faramir. And I said, actually, they wrote it in such a way that they could do Faramir completely faithful in Return of the King and it's still consistent. Right. Um, which they did. But uh, no, 
I was 16. I was, yeah, in anticipation, like I was not, my parents were probably not going to let all of us see a midnight, a Thursday night midnight showing. So I didn't see like a Thursday night midnight showing, but I did see it opening night, a uh, Friday night. So we all went to see it. My youngest brother who missed out on the first one because my parents said, <laughs> like five that's a little young oh just <laughs> a bit yeah fellowship. so i think they said okay he's seven now <laughs> we'll let him see the return of the king the younger siblings in large families always get to do the cool they stuff earlier than do... the older he siblings. saw r-rated movies way before i was ever watching r-rated movies yeah oh this is obviously an abuse of christian freedom so ah, yes we uh it. yeah so he got to see it. we all went to see it as a family and um yeah it was it was really cool and uh it was one of those films where like I came out and I was blown away and it survived. It wasn't like when I went to see the last Jedi and I came out like that was an incredible experience. Did I like that movie? I don't know if I even liked it. And then like two hours later, I'm texting my friend. I've decided I, I completely hate, hate, it. I hate <laughs> it. I hate the film. I, I we hate all the like film. that. What a strange, it's like the delayed medication. It is it's like a delayed medication. It. Two hours later, uh, the the gelatin dissolves and because I can't do it so good, but no, this one, this one is like it's held up over time. I mean, some of the graphics not so much, but a lot of them still do. And I feel like this was kind of like the first. This was kind of in the era of amazing special effects, but it was like following the example set by like guys like Spielberg with Jurassic Park, where like he knew the limits of the what he could and couldn't do. And where he had to pull back and what he had to do, you know, in more conventional ways so that it would hold up over time. Right. You know, because Jurassic Park still holds up better than Jurassic World. It just does. Very true. Um, yes. But this one, and it really does. Uh, it's still watchable, which 100%. is a feat for fantasy as well. And uh, it's epic, epic, too. So, like, well, yes, well, Willow was a part of my childhood. Willow's not that watchable today. I'm sorry. It's like a campy 80s film. Well, Zach loved the uh, Willow TV series for all of the 20 <laughs> minutes that it was on uh, Disney Plus. So we'll save that for our own uh, pop culture Boy, rant episode it. probably early next year. That's a weird kind of mo business model now where like you can't buy The Mandalorian on DVD or Blu-ray. Yet they're actually releasing. Oh, they are. Okay. One two. Yeah. But at least, well, that's what I saw anyway. I might actually get it because it is weird because all they basically because everything is streaming, they just disappear it like it's never like it never existed. Yeah, but physical media is coming back, and we'll let, let's talk later about Return of the King physical media and uh, how much of it we have, but not without uh, pausing for a sponsor too. Anthony de Groot, uh, another fantasy author. You know, Tolkien had a walking talking tree, which uh, might remind you of uh, Anthony's last name here. I'm just going to go ahead and. Recognize that going forward. Uh, remember the name. Remember the name. Are you looking for the next Christian series you could get into? This series starts with The Culling Begins, a fictional story about 12 spirit oaks who guard Eden from the great deceiver. But after standing for as long as anyone can remember, the spirit oaks begin to vanish from the world and two opposing forces begin to clash. The Spirit Oak Chronicles will take you on a journey of faith, courage, and horror all to save eden the calling begins by anthony de groot this first installment of the spirit oak chronicles is available in paperback and ebook wherever books are sold you can get those links in episode 192 show notes or go to lorehaven.com slash podcast sponsors all right really and zach we've already crossed into chapter two what did we feel after seeing the trilogy's end however uh, I would like to start here myself. I, I cannot recall feeling so satisfied and happily sad at the ending of this film. Uh, from those last few notes of the soundtrack as the credits rolled, uh, and then going back earlier, just seeing uh, those words appear on the screen, the end, but then the credits roll, and then all of this wondrous art by Alan Lee and John Howe, uh, accompanies the credits and just a, uh, a almost a, a credit salute to all of these wonderful cast members and creators and director Peter Jackson and all of that. Uh, like the movie just doesn't want to say goodbye. It just uh, wants to keep lingering. I love it when storytellers love and respect their work and their colleagues so much and their fans above all uh, that they are drawing out the welcome. Like it's only the best kind of company where you say three or four times, speaking of multiple endings, well, it's getting late. I guess it's time to get going. And then 15 minutes later, oh, you're still here. And 
I'm not irritated about that at all. So that's how I felt about Return of the King at the end. Just this complete feeling of Christmas associated bliss, by the way. The Lord <laughs> of the Rings films are Christmas films, not just because that's when they released. They carry that Christmas uh, ethos. And so now I, I get a, a little infusion of joy, not just year round uh, for Lord of the Rings, but also especially at Christmas. Really, in, how did you feel then after seeing not just the finale of The Return of the King, but knowing that this was the end of the Lord of the Rings film trilogy, truly the peak of cinema. Well, you said the, well, the, the film didn't want to say goodbye. The audience didn't want to say goodbye. I mean, these were films where the audience would applaud, right? Uh, which I think these are some of the first films I remember that happening, uh, where audiences would applaud the film. I, I was like, oh, this is new. And then especially Return of the King, cause it had that beautiful art. The, for the like 90% of the audience sat there. We're three and a half hours into the movie at this point. And everyone's, you know, ready to run out the door, but they're still, they just sit there and they just kind of absorb it. And that's what we were doing. And that was, and it was not because there was some post credit scene to see. Right, you know? I was about to say that. Yeah. There, there was no uh, Easter yeah, egg. There's no post credit scene. Me. Yeah. I was so satisfied because it ended on such a, a high note. I mean, people still, debate which is the greatest lord of the rings film and i'm going to give you a different answer depending on the day of the week but it's in many ways it is the greatest lord of the rings film because it's the culmination and i think i was just so happy that they they didn't ever there were issues for sure but they never dropped i was just so happy and satisfied and being the little geek that i was i was like Oh my goodness, and in 11 months, I get to watch the Return of the King extended version. That's <laughs> right. I had just seen the Two Towers the extended version, version and I still bought it. I remember the timestamps three hours, 20 minutes for the Return of the King. Yep. And this was after a three hour even cut of Fellowship in theaters, three hours even of the Two Towers. This time, apparently, Sir Peter Jackson just put his foot down and said, No, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. We've got to have this 20 minutes. There's too I, much character development and sacrifice. No intermission. Yeah. No intermission, no, the thing. over three hours. <laughs> I have bought these films. I bought the DVDs when they came out. I bought the extended DVDs when they came out. I bought the Blu-rays when they came out. I bought the extended Blu-rays when they came out. And then I bought the 4K versions of <laughs> these films. So I own every single version except the VHS. Yep. So <laughs> Same. <laughs> same it's i, I like, have two or three but yeah, yeah I, I, I thought i thought okay i do need to get the 4k one but well, um, that's right no i don't have any of the theatrical versions only extended i'm an extended edition purist like those are the definitive editions of the films oh we'll have to discuss, edition of Return we discuss the King. that at issue later because i do ha i do take issue with some of the extended stuff but um well some yeah. of it but it's not like the extended cut of the hobbit battle of the five armies where the only right, good right, extended right. part is thor and <clears> so, I'll just, so i'll just say for example the way i watch return of the king I will put in the extended version of Return of the King, watch to the intermission, or and then I will pop in the theatrical cut and watch the second half as a theatrical cut. Really? Yes. Does it end at the same where Grand is at the gate? Yes. For both? Okay. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's a natural cut, Zach, just because of the, you can't fit so much on a disc. It cuts out like I love the I love the Witch King confronting Gandalf, but I don't like the Witch King just shattering Gandalf's staff. So that is cut. I uh, I didn't mind the mouth of sound too much, but Aragorn in the books would never have cut off his head under the white flag. Right, of he's truce. a diplomatic emissary. Yes, right. So uh, it cuts that out. But then you have to have Saruman. I disagree with my friend Glump. I was like, ah, Saruman is not that essential. Like, yes, he is. Yes, you yes do. he is. Yes. You have to. Like, it was so jarring. That, there, that was like one experience watching the film. It was so jarring not seeing Saruman because we knew it had been filmed. We knew it had been filmed. It, it took me out of the movie for a minute. Right. He's just forgotten. Right. And of course, Saruman's fate is different in the book, but it had been filmed. Yeah. Fans knew because we kept up. Oh, we, we knew it had been, it had been filmed. And we also knew that Christopher Lee refused to go to the white, uh, the red carpet because. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Okay. So I'm today years old. Out. He was he's very upset that they cut him out and he did all that work and they completely cut him out of the movie. Um, he refused to go, but so there were a few moments like that, but yeah. Um, that was uh yeah I was a uh, I was still on because I knew I was going to get something else in November. 
Yeah, that, <laughs> well, and, and then a few years after that, they started releasing the complete recordings of the soundtrack. So there was just so much material mm-hmm. that I think, I mean, that's right. I was getting new Lord of the Rings material. If you include the complete recordings of the soundtrack, the deluxe box set of CDs, I think through 2006. But I have to go back and, uh, and check on that. Zach, how did you feel after seeing the end of this uh, momentous trilogy? Yeah, I just kept thinking, what's going to top this? Like, what's going to come next? You know, we we had seen the Star Wars prequels, I think, by this point, right? And I thought, well, maybe we'll get new Star Wars movies that'll finish off the... Uh... <laughs> oh, poor lad. <laughs> <laughs> you could time travel and uh, warn yourself, would so, you? <laughs> but it's so, it is so sad, because what, what tops it? Like, yeah. I, the, I was listening to one of the... You know, the the best content that D Do- Daily Wire ever produces is the, just the discussions with all their people all together. Yeah, and Agreed. Andrew Clavin said, "Yeah, there's no." He said, "There's no great cinema anymore." He said, "When was the last great piece of cinema?" And one of them said, "The Lord of the Rings." That was the last, like, truly masterpiece piece of cinema. And and you said the key phrase earlier, really, and which is something we've talked about quite often on this podcast, which is faith. It's a faithful adaptation. It's it's not a story that's being stripped down for parts and being used to forward some kind of narrative or push a political agenda it is purely the story now obviously they're adapting certain things to screen cutting some things out uh, you right. know everyone everyone laments the untimely death of tom bombadil and then right. there's the whole sharky thing you know <laughs> but even so those it, changes weren't to serve an agenda right and exactly. everyone knew it, that it was you know what this doesn't really work on the screen yeah. and it doesn't really work yeah. with the flow of the story like i fought the farmer thing i still think the farmer change was terrible and i think their justification doesn't work but it's wife. not like they did it for a cynical reason right exactly right i'll defend the motives if not uh exactly what happened i'll right. defend motives and execution yeah but the decision itself like it did seem at the time without the completion of the return of the king which did go back to book Firemere. you're right i think it, it, the intent was to set that up uh, the intent was not to say that uh, you know there are no true heroes, especially when right. you compare the Lord of the Rings and its respect for heroes, earnest, flawed heroes, uh, with other deconstructed heroes in other movies since. Like even with Faramir, there's just no comparison. You know, even Faramir, the Chronicles of Narnia movies, like oh, they they did some of that. Agreed. There are no heroes. Some of that came in a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit, and that was just a few years later. Yeah, yeah. it's it's really really very sad. But you know, Faramir. There he is in in the the Two Towers film, you know, going through a kind of trauma, you know, being rejected for no reason, and yet Faramir is in it uh, not just to please his father and certainly not just to please himself. Uh, he's in it to protect his country. He is loyal to his country, Gondor, and no matter what his father says, uh, he is going to follow orders the best he can uh, and do his best. And that that is just marvelous. And I think that still holds up in uh, in the Return of the King. I, I don't think. I can't think of any Faramir cringe moments like uh, in the return of the King. It's last time I read the book, I remember thinking, wow, like Tolkien actually did almost this modern sounding uh, thing where uh, Denethor, uh, Faramir's father, the steward of Gondor uh, is just rude and terrible toward Faramir. Just, he's a bad dad, Uh, (laughs) not going to get the world's greatest steward coffee mug on father's day. (laughs) Uh, and it, that feels it, it, like it could have been from an adaptation, but that is in the original. Uh, there's so a merch idea right off. there. Yeah. That totally is, you know, that actually is, and you have to put the little cherry tomato. You're only on, getting this on, because it is technically Father's Day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that worked out. Um, and of course, th- there's a few other um, a few other changes made uh, from book to film. Uh, I think the one that rises to uh, the top uh, is the division between Frodo and Sam. Uh, near the yeah. top of the steps of uh, uh, Father, uh, well, going to Shelob's lair near Kirith Ungol. Uh, that's not in the book. I think the most important thing for these introduced adaptation tension. changes, though, it introduced this tension. I get it, but also it feels like it could have been in the book. Like people might say Tolkien would never. Well, Tolkien could have, you know, but there's other things that Tolkien would never. As uh, Jack Sparrow once said, there's a difference between what a man can do what a man will do right and And, tolkien could have done that it it is not a theme inorganic to the universe even if it is inorganic to the books that's why i was didn't have a huge issue with like for example tom bombadil being cut out because is it conceivable to me that he would have written the book without tom bombadil i I can imagine i can imagine the version where he would have written it without tom bombadil um and i like tom bombadil but it's yes it's not like something he wouldn't 
have done. I think he wouldn't have had Gandalf smack Denethor slapstick style. No, like, I don't think and, so. You know, and and uh, but all that to say, it, the other thing that was so stunning, it was hard to find a part of the film where like the production was amazing, the acting was amazing, the script was amazing. I mean, it had it was a big hill to climb, right? Because it's an adaptation, but the visual effects. The special effects it was all amazing and that it was hard to see we weren't really seeing films come together like that i mean there were a few gladiator being one you know that kind of blew people away on a visual uh, kind of an epic story but there were not it wasn't a lot of that and i feel like we again it kind of peaked i feel like in the 2000s and i feel like it's not like well yeah well, it's easier to do that than ever now and like i think like what a digital just closed um right stuttering now which blows me away yeah, yeah it's, it's just kind of amazing how you know we and we see this and this is a theme in society and it's a theme in the return of the king in the book that's the dialogue made it into the extended version where gandalf talks about how gondor is falling and he says they yes. built monuments more monuments to their sires than to their sons the houses of the dead look grander than the houses of the living and they weren't invested in the future of their society and you know we see that today but there's a lot there's a lot there it, it is a whole segment in the two towers book it just goes to why i love lord of the rings um because there's so much there you just counter upon rereading but faramir is explaining to frodo i think it's faramir saying that he's well we we were a high society we still consider ourselves this high society we're not quite as high society as we used to be basically because he said we don't we don't study we don't we're not scholars the way we used to be. He said it used to, they, everyone used to believe that a s- scholar and a warrior should be the same. You know, like the, the kind of like the warrior poet idea. And he said that's, and that's gone now. We don't, we don't uh, approach it that way. And so there's so, there's a lot there I think about in terms of society with, with Gondor, but it's, it's a very, yeah, this just, I'm looking forward to. So now my kids are growing up and I'm looking forward to the days where, they're going to learn that Darth Vader is Luke's father and they're going to learn, <laughs> they're going to experience the books. Uh, I'm violating a rule right now because I am taking my four-year-old to see the horse and his boy play. I started reading the books to him and my mom's like, you need to start reading the books. I started reading. I'm like, I started reading. I'm like, let it listening patiently. He is not comprehending everything that's going on. <laughs> I will read it to him a little bit later, but I think he'll still enjoy the play. So I'm going to take him to see the horse. Mm-hmm. It'll still be new to him. Like he's, when when he's a little older, he'll experience the book and he'll remember it. I think I think that's allowed. Uh, my guess is though, uh, uh, really, and if some of these uh, tendencies hold true, children who are raised uh, to in, embrace sports as the be all end all uh, end up turning into nerds. What happens if the reverse is true? You're probably going to end up having a uh, a football player child. Uh, I, I don't know. Raise them in the ways of Narnia. I feel like Tolkien. I have an exciting job, but uh, and I was kind of the geek as a kid. That, that that may certainly help. That may certainly help. Yeah, I, I have to. I'll have to decide. Okay, do I start them off on the extended versions all the way through, and then tell them? By the way, there are these theatrical versions, or do it the reverse? I don't know. I haven't decided. I have a few years. My dad started reading the Lord of the Rings to me when I was like seven and or eight. And I, at She Loves Lair, I said, yeah, this is stop. I said, yeah, this is too scary. And so he waited one, he, so we read through all of Sherlock Holmes, like every single Sherlock Holmes. By the time he was done with every single Sherlock Holmes, we started Lord of the Rings again, and I was able to get all the way through it. I need to do an episode of Fantastical Truth, Zach, about uh, when to introduce uh, children to certain kinds of stories. That, yes. That'd be an interesting one to tackle next year yes. sometime. Because we've gone through all of Narnia. I, I, yeah. Obviously, Narnia, like, when I was six or seven or whatever. The Lord of the Rings was, it's a little scary uh, for a little kid with a big imagination. Oh, quite. The Barrow the Whites, even just the Barrow, Barrow Whites. Whites. They were she too scary loved, for Peter Jackson, she clearly. Chapter, that, was, that was where I just couldn't take it anymore. I, I told him to stop. <laughs> I don't know if he started over again. I think he started over again at Fellowship. I don't think he gave me a, okay, I'll summarize it for you a year later. No, I think he started over again at Fellowship. My seven-year-old son has been reading the graphic novel adaptation of The Hobbit. And that's been a really good way to introduce him to the story because he's he's just much more into graphic novels than how old is books he right now? He's seven. See, I've thought about getting. I've, I I want to get the Hobbit for my ten year old nephew, and I 
been wondering if I should get him the graphic novel version yeah. or get him the regular. He's read oh, all of Harry so Potter fun. books. Like all the if Harry he's Potter read books. all the Harry Potter books, he can certainly handle the Hobbit. It I think so. That's why I'm like, ah, short. I could get them for that for him later if he wants to re-experience it in a different way. Right, but I think you'd want to uh, have him experience just the words, and so that he can do that thing where you imagine the characters on well, your I own. Think I might get him the Alan Lieber. Oh well, that is the definitive illustration. So it's just so fun in that graphic novel because there's like a whole page where it talks about you know Sting the sword. Yeah, there's a whole page where it talks you know it shows it and all these different panels talks about the history of it. I mean that that's just that's so fun for a boy you know to actually see the sword because it it's sort of that blend right of like you're reading the book but you're seeing kind of what you would see on the screen, uh, which I I would definitely not watch that movie with my seven-year-old i mean he's he's very much a boy's boy but he you know he's a sensitive kid and he's only seven so that that movie's definitely too scary for a single digit kids <laughs> i would say so i wonder if the horse and his boy is going to be a little too scary for my four-year-old and i really hope not oh that's a good question <laughs> we'll find out this afternoon <laughs> Well, uh, maybe if the stories are too scary that you're finding, you'll want to go out and write some of your own. And in which case, you'll want our third sponsor, the I Write course, How to Write a Novel. Are you looking for a fun yet challenging writing class for your teen or yourself? I Write, How to Write a Novel is an online writing course that will teach you how to write novels that your friends and even strangers will want to read, how to overcome writer's block and gather ideas, and much more. A mentorship option is also available to go along with the course. I Write is taught by EJ Kitchens, a professional copy editor, former college lab instructor, an award-nominated author of the Star Clock Chronicles and Magic Collector's books. For more information and to enroll, visit ejkitchens.com slash courses. You can also see that description and the link in our show notes for episode 192. Chapter three, gentlemen, how have the Lord of the Rings films aged since 2003? I've already talked a little bit about the uh, splendor of the visual effects. There are some glitches here and there. There are some, you know, obviously, uh, retrospective views that realize, wow, we were really caught up in a, in a hype there, weren't we? But at once, I'd say, yes, we were caught up in a hype, but it was also 100% justified. And 20 years later, uh, really, and you mentioned that some of the visual effects now just don't look as good. And some of that may be because of a bunch of things that filmmakers might get into is directors not knowing visual effects as well and not knowing what they're capable of and what their limits are and thereby making a better story that respects the limits. By the way, there's an application there to morality as well. Uh, but I'll start with you, Zach. Like, if you've seen the films since then, like, how yeah. has the whole trilogy, but especially Return to the King, like, how does it strike you now about 20 years later? Yeah, it, it holds up really well. And, and kind of like Rillian was saying, I, I have the uh, extended edition DVDs or, or maybe Blu rays, but then I got, the, I got the digital download on, you know, iTunes of the 4K. And I'm really looking forward to watching those over the Christmas break with our teenagers. Oh, you are in for a treat. We, we watched the 4K, uh, I think it was last year, or maybe it was the year before. I mean, I, I don't have a 4K TV, <laughs> but I, I have a... Okay, well, it still may look good. But I have the well, 4K version. The color grading. There were some glitches in the Blu-ray color grading, believe it or not. Yeah, a lot of people were commenting on. And so they rolled it back uh, and for you're the stuck 4K with release. It. There's no software up or date for That's Blu-rays. Right. But uh, that also means it can't be censored or, or whatever. But yeah, I didn't get one of those Black Friday deals and get a 4K TV. But I'm really looking forward to watching that with our, our teenager kids. How it holds up. So here's, here's what I w I've been thinking about. This movie is always going to hold up. Whether or not you think the effects hold up, whether or not certain production things, because it's earnest. <laughs> you know, it's like it's real heroes trying to do real heroic things. And there's real stakes. Um, I was recently watching the Chris Pine Dungeons and Dragons. I think it was through uh, Amazon or or something. Better than Rings of Power. That was surprisingly good. <laughs> it was better than that. But, you know, the, the whole movie is, it's kind of snarky, cynic, a little cynical, a little self-referential, kind of breaking the fourth wall, which, okay, it's based on a board game. But even the uh, the adaptation on Amazon of uh, Wheel of Time does this a little bit too. And that that's even more jarring because the books are not, that way the books are not that snarky cynical you know political whatever uh, over over sexualized kind of stuff and and that's what makes lord of the rings hold up because it's not any of that it's it's genuine and it it has like genuine beliefs this genuine good 
Um, I was listening to something else this week that, that was making the point that, you know, the age we're living through now, it's trying to blur, if not destroy all boundaries between things. But when you look in the Bible, the Bible is all about boundaries. It, it's light. I mean, just starting with creation, there's, there's land and water, there's light and day, there's animal, there's human, there's man, there's woman, there's good, there's evil. Um, you know, th- all throughout the Bible, there, there's these boundaries, these categories, these definitions, and the age we're living in is trying to just wipe all of that away. And, th- and that goes between heroes and villains. Now, can a hero be flawed? Sure. Can a villain have some redeeming quality? Well, of course, that's why we love Darth Vader. You know, we, we love finding out that he's Luke's father and that he's a redeemable character. That, that, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this you know, this idea that there's no real heroes or there's no real villains. Everyone's just kind of this gray goo. And the Lord of the Rings doesn't uh, entertain that stupid idea at all. <laughs> I love what you just said because it's, it's so true. And, and it doesn't create caricatures either. Right. That's why like, I took such issue with uh, the film The Joker that came out. Very well acted film. Very well shot film. But it is very much that concept. There is no agency. There's kind of this deterministic mechanism that makes a villain, right? No one has any real choice to become a villain. And uh, and there's no hero in the story either. And that was actually, I recently watched, it took best uh, film Oscar last year. Uh, And I joked it was kind of like maybe one of the worst films I've ever uh, seen. Everything, everywhere, all at once, all the time, right now, forever. Um, (laughs) But... (laughs) I watched the film. I was like, boy, this like when people ask me, is it what's the worst film you've ever seen? I'm gonna think of this film and then I'm gonna remember I also saw Matrix 4 and I'm gonna say Matrix 4. But <laughs> the, the, but what was there was actually a lot to unpack in the film. One of them being it has no understanding of good and evil. It truly does not. It has an idea of what niceness is, niceness and understanding and acceptance, not really the same as true good and evil even the way it i won't completely spoil it but it's this conflict with this daughter in this multiverse and mother daughter and the daughter in another version of the multiverse is like this super villain and like the idea that someone you like you've created this villain right in the story who is actually trying to destroy the multiverse it's like, like this superhero this evil super villain trying to destroy the multiverse the idea that someone like that can just flip because you give them a nice talk and a hug and like that's that completely like one of those two things like they don't fit together there are some people that need the hug and the nice talk those aren't the people trying to burn the world down and <laughs> the people trying to yeah. burn the world down you know you can't do that to the joker and then he, and that was one thing i did love about the dark knight is understood the concept of yeah there is actually real evil Right. And a tragic backstory doesn't just make you a villain. You're yes. not determined it, by that. Yes. Right. In, in fact, my friend Glumpuddle, we were discussing the Dark Knight. He didn't pick up on the first viewing. He didn't realize that whenever the Joker gives his backstory to people and talks about how he became, he's lying every time. Yeah. He changes it. It's, right. He's not telling the truth because he is pure evil. The backstory doesn't matter. But the watch going back to the Return of the King, the heroes, like there are so many heroes and they're not perfect. You can see they're not perfect, but it doesn't mean they're not heroes. Just like how there are villains. Like Gollum is interesting. He's nuanced. He has layer upon layer and depth, but he is not someone that you can, you know, have the nice talk with and give a hug to and, you know, change him. That's not, which itself is also a deterministic kind of frame of mind. I didn't mind it so much in the newest Spider-Man movie because I thought, well, that is very much a Peter Parker Spider-Man type thing. I get that, so I didn't mind it for that. But again, it's not it's not real. That's not how real issues work in terms of like in the way in Lord of the Rings, the when you look at who is redeemed, you know, like Boromir is a great example. Boromir is a hero. Boromir is flawed, and Boromir is redeemed, and he still dies. Yeah, you know, th- there's a hard consequence that he can't get around right the lord of the rings films respect the limits of the real world they also respect i would say the eternal perspective that they inherited from a tolkien one of the best moments in the return of the king is when gandalf and pippin are on their station they're just uh, guarding an entrance waiting for the inevitable it's a scene that's not in the book 
not in the book, but it is drawn from the worldview of the yes. book. Gandalf is telling Pippin about Valinor, and he's using lines from the book uh, near the very end of the Return of the King book, not including the appendices. And it's such a wonderful scene, and the soundtrack uh, honors that uh, longing for eternity. And I think that moment is absolutely sublime. And then if you pay attention to the soundtrack, that is the theme that repeats when Sam picks up Frodo. And that is the theme of that eternal resolution that repeats again uh, when the uh, ring is destroyed. That's there. It's just the, the continuity there is extraordinary. And you can't get that for certain modern versions that claim to now wear the mantle of the Lord of the Rings, Amazon's trope, for example. You can't get that under the rules of the current uh, zeitgeist. People were rightly sharing this quote from Peter Jackson uh, in response to that series. Uh, and this is the quote I want you all to react to. Peter Jackson, uh, undated here. I, I know this is uh, valid, though. He says, uh, we made a promise to ourselves at the beginning of the process that we weren't going to put any of our own politics, our own messages or our own themes into these movies. What we were trying to do was to analyze what was important to Tolkien and to try to honor that. In a way, we were trying to make these films for him, not for ourselves. Absolutely terrific quote. Uh, that one and the quote yeah. uh, about Melkor distorting uh, the song of, uh, of Eru Iluvatar in the Silmarillion. Like Those were the quotes I saw blasted to all of the uh, trailers for the rings of power and I, I don't blame the people making rings of power i think they just did not understand what you were talking about really and this natural boundary between good and evil and not being cynical about characters like you can only copy a copy a copy a copy for so long <laughs> before you start losing uh, the integrity of the original and so that's why the lord of the rings films hold up and um uh, I mean, we're not talking much about the Hobbit films either, but I think even the Hobbit films are better than some people trying to do the Lord of the Rings adaptations today. Uh, if you are to try to adapt it today, you're going to have to go back to the original, go back to what they knew, uh, go back to the sources that Tolkien was reading. Like, don't even just read Tolkien and honor Tolkien. What was he reading and honoring? And as far back as you please, uh, once you read more of that stuff, the more you're going to understand where he was coming from. There's kind of a, when we talked about this on the Narnia podcast, uh, there is a huge societal gap right now in terms of what is truth and how malleable are facts. And it's so funny that even when it tried to rear its head in films in the past, like even when Obi-Wan Kenobi tried to tell Luke, well, depending on your point of view, from a certain point of view, you're kind of like, from a certain point of view, yeah, it's like from a certain point of view, like, or when Obi Wan and Revenge of the Sith. Well, from my point of view, well, uh, Anakin says, "Well, from my point of view," and then he goes, "Well, you really are lost." Then the story was planned from the beginning. It's like it doesn't that, fit. It doesn't even fit in the story, you know? Not really. Just like Luke kissing his sister. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like it, I think that films in the past were so grounded in that objective truth. One of my favorite films of all time. Uh, it, it'd be like my "You're Sent to an Island." You can bring ten films. This might make the list uh, if you count Lord of the Rings as one film. Secondhand Lions. With oh, that's Robert, a good one. With Robert Duvall and Michael Caine. There's this part where Robert Duvall tells the kid, he goes, well, if you want to believe something, just believe it. Just because it's, it is kind of presented as this is the good truth of the good character. Yeah, right? postmodernism. Like, yeah, totally. like, if you want to believe something, believe in it. Just because something's not true doesn't mean you can't believe in it, right? Certain things are worth believing if they're not true. And, but he's talking about his backstory. Like, hey, did you really do these things? Were you really this? Did your wife really do this? Or did you really, were you really this heroic? He's like, well, if you want to believe it, just believe it. And that's presented as true, but by the end of the movie, you know that doesn't cut it. The right. film like it contradicts itself. It mm. it because the whole ending of the movie rests on actually it all was true, and that's the the final moment, like the mm. final five minutes of the movie is where he realizes it was all true. Right. And and, and so the film contradicts itself. So even the film trying to be postmodern can get away from it, but modern films have completely gotten away from it. You know, I I think about. I, I love Christopher Nolan and the, the first movie I saw from him was Memento, which uh, is about a guy with no short term memory, but he's got his long term memory. And, uh, and, and the film is told brilliantly because it, it starts at the end and kind of pieces piece by piece goes towards the beginning. And then there's these in, in between scenes that's actually going in the forward direction. So, you know, it's kind of art house, very art house, but it's the only way yeah. he, he only he could have done it. Like basically do a movie backwards. Right. And so, well, spoiler alert, but it's been 20 years it, at the end of the, so he's, he's chasing this guy, the whole story named Sammy Jenkins that he says killed his wife. 
And at the end of the film, um, th- he realizes that, th- that he's, he's never going to catch this guy because he's already been caught, but he, he's got to give himself purpose. And so he, he says about this other character, well, you can be my Sammy. And so he, and then he leaves himself a clue. He, he puts all these tattoos on himself and, and writes all these things down to give himself clues because he knows he's going to forget. And, and he basically sets himself up to just kind of chase down this rabbit hole. Uh, with, with with what he knows is a lie, just to keep himself going, and I I thought it was actually such a critique of this idea of of subjective truth and in postmodernism that, uh, in that he's he's making himself the villain and knowing what he's doing. So, but yeah, like you said, with with Dark Knight, there there's clear good, there's clear evil, even though Bruce Wayne has very much a tragic backstory. I, I want to he's flawed talk about, too. Yeah, he's not perfect. And I want to talk about another uh, book to film adaptation that I'm really excited for, which maybe this, you know, may, maybe we're going to get some good cinema, which is Dune Part Two. The trailer two, just the dropped last recently. Teaser looks so good. It's sublime. And, I'm you know, I only that. watched the first five seconds of it and I'm like, you know what? I already know I'm going to see this film. So I'm just going to wait to see it in theater because th- this is kind of how I am. I don't like spoilers sure. if I know I'm going to see it. So, and I, I saw tell you, I've, I've read the book. I yeah, have not seen Dune Part One. I missed oh, it in wow. theaters, and uh, right now I'm in a phase like rocking babies to sleep that I am stuck to like watching stuff on my phone, and I really don't want to watch Dune <laughs> on my phone. No, that's right. No, you should wait. <laughs> so if you I can. want yeah. to find a time I can watch on my father-in-law's 4K. So I'm, I'm there you holding go. off. I do know the story, but I have not seen the first film. W- what I'm excited about with that is is how faithful the first movie was, Dune Part One, to the book. Now, obviously adaptation and, and whatnot but the the core of the story was paul and the duke of atreides so that that father-son bond and you know what comes in to disrupt that how that bond gives paul stability when he goes through b- a bunch of different trials in the story which i'll try not to spoil because okay you haven't seen it but but that if it's faithful movie, to the book, I know what it is. Yeah, yeah. It's and it's very earnest. It's like there are real heroes, there are real bad guys. Yeah. There are things worth fighting for. Heroism matter, truth matters. It takes itself how can I put it? It it takes itself seriously. And, and maybe that's really the big problem with so many adaptations. They don't take themselves seriously. Well, there's another movie coming out. Uh it's now being uh pillaged by critics. It's uh Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon Part One, A Child of Fire. Uh, I'm not as much of a Snyder stan as people think I've only ever seen his DC movies. So for all I care, like it could be a so, so movie. It could be terrific. It could be bad, but in this case, it is fascinating to see the critics just absolutely destroying the movie. And for reasons that do not seem valid, like they seem to hate the fan base. And I'm sorry, I cannot help but note that a lot of these critics, like they are, uh, irritated at how serious the movie seems to be. And they view that as. Uh, self-important and pretentious while they're praising to the skies either genuinely self-important pretentious movies uh, or they are giving a pass to some everything everywhere all at once or corporate superhero bloated like you know you know thrice reshot crowd pleasers and it's it's very difficult not to conclude now uh, that earnestness makes people feel guilty makes people feel weird Uh, they don't like it Uh, and and something like dune like i think it it gets away with it because it hits a certain it hits a certain level of praise that bypasses people's censors, but other people like if the, if the fans are a little rowdy and then the critics will just go, well, I think I'd rather hate on the fan base and get paid to do it. And, uh, that's, that's really gross. It's not why we should like stories. I, I am all for earnest stories. And I think that's, I'm so glad you said that, um, about return of the King, because that's what that is. Are there funny moments? Yes. They are character driven. Do they ever step on the genre? Uh, or the story itself, or wink and nod to the audience to say that somebody's in on the joke and too cool for this school. No, the Lord of the Rings films never do that. Uh, well, the closest they come maybe is with the Legolas action hero moments, which is very clearly yeah. like just okay. We're that going to a allow laser like moment. right yeah. one or two anime action hero. Yeah. You know, Legolas does something impossible to make the fangirls swoon, and even as the fangirls swoon. They are laughing at themselves for swooning, but right. they're having fun at the same time. And I, I do wish those were gone because like, you know what? They're all in their forties now. <laughs> right. Right. So, and, and what's even funnier like, is that Orlando Bloom is also in on the joke. It just, it is impossible to hate any of the actors in that film. 
I do not hate Peter Jackson. I, I love the guy. I'll forever respect him for taking this on. Uh, all of his uh, all of his crew is co-authors. Uh, the visual effects, uh, the guys, even doing the, the creatures. Yeah, even uh, like I to this day. So I, I thought it was interesting. I found out recently because I was thought, you know, I always had a perfect actor for Aragorn. I thought he would be the the perfect Aragorn. So I always feel like Viggo Mortensen is a gr- amazing actor, but he's a different Aragorn from the book. And then I found out that actually Peter Jackson's first choice for Aragorn was also my first choice, but he was unavailable. Daniel Day Lewis. Oh man, that would have been. And I amazing. thought if you watch the Last of the Mohicans, if you've never seen it, it's like watching a, a movie about Strider. Like it yeah, is, I just watched that recently. Like, oh, it wow, is. Okay. Like, I thought Maybe he I would be the perfect. There, he has the physique, he has the bearing. He would have been the perfect Aragorn, but apparently he he thought, well, this is going to be like an action. This is going to be like an action fantasy film and i'm more like a deep character noir actor and you know, like i think he didn't understand that it would have been which vigo wouldn't have gone for the role either he didn't want to do that but the son said he had to and that was the only hook because i think some people just didn't understand that this isn't going to just be some cheap fantasy no no this is something special and uh, unfortunately daniel lady lewis didn't understand that oh maybe somewhere out in the multiverse he did play aragorn uh and and arwen went to helm <laughs> well no in the future 20 years from now we'll just do an ai recreate the lord of the rings with daniel day lewis playing just Aragorn. don't speak that do not speak <laughs> this doom into existence no what we'll always have uh well lord willing we will always have the lord of the rings trilogy the peak of cinema an extraordinary celebration of things that are good in this world and are worth fighting for uh, a celebration of the condemnation of sin, the beauty of humanity, and the wonder of victory, and the uh, longing for eternity uh, when all of God's true heroes uh, will go uh, to that place beyond the sky. So, uh, Zach, really, and uh, thanks for joining us. Well, Zach's always here, but uh, really, and thanks for joining us for this uh, season conclusion for Fantastical Truth. Uh, but what are y'all doing at uh, Talking Beasts, and where can folks follow your work there? So the best way to find us is just go to narniaweb.com and you can find our podcast there. You can also find our podcast on uh, Apple Podcasts. It's just called Talking Beasts and we do them. We run them in seasons. So we'll do like a spring and a fall season, do two episodes a month. Like I think it's it's the first and third Thursday of every month. We uh, have been going through a discussion about the new Narnia Netflix movie news, as well as going through The Magician's Nephew as a book commentary so you can uh, go we haven't even finished going people when the movies the wall the movies kind of s- petered out with the uh, vo- voyage of the green mist they said oh well i guess your podcast is going to end right because there's nothing else we said oh no no we we have lots and lots of material that is good we're not even we're not even pints with jack <laughs> there are still the books there's the fan theories we can start the fight about the white witch and, we're not uh, even pints with jack where they have a voluminous amount of material let's go through the great divorce in detail we don't even do, have to do that we have <laughs> enough with narnia that we can narnia. just we uh we will touch other cs Lewis stuff in tangential uh areas but uh it is very much narnia at the focus and yeah we have plenty of material we're still going you can also follow at Prince underscore Rillian on Twitter and uh, sign up for the Narnia web uh, website too. It's a great way to keep up with uh, what is old and beautiful in Narnia as well as what is new and hopefully would be beautiful with the Netflix adaptation. So Rillian, thanks for joining us. Uh, you can just vanish on out of here whenever you choose. Well, we would love to hear from you, our listener, about the return of the King and just the Lord of the Rings movies in general. We'd love to know, did you see return of the King in theaters? What did you think about it when it concluded the trilogy and how do these films uh, teach fans and movies today about, about truth, good and evil and other uh, great lessons. Uh, What do you think about these films 20 years later? So send us a note to podcast at lorehaven.com. We'd love to read your note on the air or comment on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And of course, you can uh, talk to us in our exclusive Lorehaven Guild that's on Discord. And we've gotten a couple of comments here, Stephen. Um, this was about the, uh, when we discussed a little bit about the Stephen Lawhead adaptation of the, uh, the Pendragon cycle, Brooks Kirsch wrote, quote, the first book, Hood, has a very cinematic Batman Begins feel to it. I'd love to see it on screen. 
From there, the subsequent books change their focus to other characters, which might not work for a film trilogy. It might need some restructuring, end quote. Now, that is interesting. We'll have to see how they, uh, the Daily Wire uh, accomplishes that. Um, that that sounds like a big challenge. And well, I, this one is specifically about the other series that was optioned. Uh, oh, we had oh, a news oh article. right. This is Hood. This is not the Pendragon cycle. This is the uh, King Raven trilogy. Okay. So, yes, apparently we're just getting not the Daily Wire. Head I'm, I'm all getting over the place. Up. Yeah. Nope. It's another. It's another <laughs> director. Uh, it was a whole uh, whole story we did uh, about another director who just just a few weeks ago had optioned right. the King Raven trilogy, which is a retelling of the Robin Hood stories. So okay. lots of great discussion there. Lots of Stephen Lawhead fans, and I must say, I'm gonna have to catch up uh, because I have not grown up reading these books like a lot of people have. So yeah. it's Lord of the Rings all over again. <laughs> we have to catch up with the uh, giant, uh, quietly popular fantasy franchise before the motion picture or streaming version. Thank you for uh, that live us. update there. And uh, we also got a comment from Frank Lattimore who said, quote, it's taken far too long for Lawhead's books to reach deeper into the entertainment industry. I've read everything he's written after I finished the Airlandia series starting back in the 1980s and enjoyed them all. Well, his Bright Empire series had an awful conclusion. It started dying in book two, end quote. Well, that is, you know, that's great to hear that though, Frank, that you've kind of seen the good and the bad. You've, you've got your favorites there from his books and yeah, it, it does seem like it has taken a long time for these books to really take off, but I'm so glad that they have. I mean, Lord of the Rings was written, you know, decades and decades before Peter Jackson came along. So there's always hope for a good book to become a movie. Getting busy over at lorehaven.com even as we prepare for our holiday break. Subscribe free at lorehaven.com and get whatever updates you want. We track the best Christian fantastical novels wherever you find them, along with a news item about cousin genres or uh, authors. Stephen Lawhead being one of those, a very prolific author now suddenly having his adaptations reach the interest of filmmakers, including uh, uh, director Brent Ryan Green. He optioned the film and TV rights to the King Raven trilogy with the books Hood, Scarlet, and Tuck. That was a variety report actually on November 29th, and uh, we just found our way uh, to us. Uh, A.D. Sheehan wrote that news article. You can get that at lorehaven.com uh, near the top of the page as we're recording. We also have an article from uh, Jenneth Dick, our resident uh, chosen expert, and she, her article said, after this year's fan event and film releases, the chosen effect is bigger than ever really exploring uh, how this series has changed the lives of its actors and the popular culture and uh, really a whole lot of how Christians make stories and the reasons why we make stories. Lots of great stuff going on out there. Subscribe free, get updates. And Zach mentioned the Lorehaven Guild. That is our Discord community pushing 300 heroes now as we draw this year to a close. We're drawing our next uh, book quest to a close, our current book quest to a close rather. And the next month, we start our third Narnia book quest for The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. I'm putting those questions together now. It's going to be fun. It's going to be amazing. Lots of great uh, Lewis content there. So if you haven't had enough C.S. Lewis from our last little mini series here or Tolkien, uh, you're going to get more of that with The Voyage of the Dawn Treader book quest lasting throughout the month of January 2024. So next on fantastical truth we are on break for christmas there shall be no new episode on tuesday december 26th we'll be too busy playing with our presents and in early january we will return to kick off our 2024 season of fantastical truth from lore haven you can expect more great conversations about the best christian imaginative stories uh, we got an episode planned about story allergies with some feedback from previous guests uh, video games, how Christians make them, why we enjoy them, all that sort of thing. Even a behind the scenes glimpse about how fantastical novels get made. Meanwhile, Zach and I and all the team at Lorehaven and presumably all of the guests that we've enjoyed meeting over the past year wish to wish you the best holiday season, an amazing conclusion to Advent as we herald the birth of our Savior, uh, the God man, Jesus Christ, uh, he's the one who gives us the gift above all other gifts, which is himself. So we worship him. We praise him. We also thank him for the gift of fantastic imagination and the technology that lets us all gather together, no matter where we are, but united in faith of our King as we continue to seek and find his fantastical truth. <laughs>